What do drugs, secret software programs, dirty money, and super spies have in common? You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, everybody. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings, Earthlings, to all of you out there watching YouTube, whether from a public IP or a proxy that you're trying to sneak through Tor. Thanks for tuning in. That is Matt behind the camera. I'm Ben. That makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Now, for everybody who's jumping down to the comments to type, bring back the old format, don't worry. This is an addition to our old format. And we have a new episode coming out this week. We wanted to give you a little bit of historical context in this quick update. First things first, the concept of continual surveillance, right? It predates the internet and it's spooky stuff. It goes all the way back to Bentham's notion of a panopticon and even further back from there, the idea that we could continually keep tabs on every single inmate in a prison or citizen of a country as it's turning out. And the idea of using big data to electronically track and monitor people is also older than a lot of people understand. This whole thought crime, pre-crime, can we stop potential troublemakers before they crumble the status quo idea, this dates back to the late 1970s or the early 1980s when a company that was really good at software but really bad at making names decided to call themselves INSLAW, and that's I-N-S-L-A-W. Yeah, I don't know either. Anyway, aside from names, they were pretty smart cookies, and they were awarded a contract by the Department of Justice to install a program called PROMISE in 42 attorneys' offices across the United States. And this is where the trouble began. Just imagine, it's, you know, it's the early 1980s. Most people have never heard of anything like the internet, and this company is selling Uncle Sam the ability to track, correlate, and maybe even predict the actions of potential troublemakers. You know, who, who got arrested last year in Pennsylvania uh, for a, uh, at a political protest? Boom, there's the list. Who refused to pay their taxes year A through year X? Boom, there's the list. Who on list A matches list B? Boom. So make no mistake, the power of software like Promise was evident to everyone involved in the project, but soon enough, INSLAW and the Department of Justice began not to get along. Why? Well, INSLAW figured out that the Department of Justice and the United States government were enhancing versions of promise, were building upon the original code, and maybe even sharing it out with some allies, all of which violated the terms of their licensing agreements. You know, how when you sell software, you're actually selling a license. So what do you do if you're a company in the United States and you're fighting the government? Well, you go to court. So, INSLAW went to court. They alleged that the U.S. Department of Justice was not only not paying their contract, not only violating the license, but also illegally driving them to bankruptcy in order to silence them. A bankruptcy judge at the time named George Basin said, you know what, this case makes sense. This checks out. And he gave the president of INSLAW, a guy named Bill Hamilton, $6.8 million in damages. Uh, the ruling was appealed of course, after uh, the bankruptcy judge was not reappointed, which is a great way of saying fired. Uh, who ended up taking his seat at the bankruptcy court? Why, well, one of the lawyers who was arguing in the Inslaw case. Coincidence? Yeah, maybe. So it goes to appeals and the Senate gets involved, and the Senate has a subcommittee investigating this to see what's going on. Various players in the Senate have their misgivings and they talked to people in the Department of Justice, all of whom refused to go on record for fear of losing their jobs. So, in the end, at least at this part of the story, the Senate says, despite our uh, trepidation about this case, we can't say there's any evidence of wrongdoing. Of course, adding a little, a little tag like that, we can't say that there is, is very different from saying there is not. And it turns out that Oliver North was probably using this program, Promise, to uh, again, chick, 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 
collate files in a way that had never been done before on various people who might be a challenge to national security or the status quo. And this is just United States activity. Let's remember a couple of other things that were happening during this time frame. Uh, it slowly came to light that the CIA was working with a bank called BCCI. It also uh, slowly came to light that uh, there was some pretty compelling evidence that uh, members of the US government had gone rogue and against the wishes of Congress, uh, they were selling arms to Iran illegally uh, in order to get money to fund weaponry for Contras in Nicaragua. And this strange convoluted international passage of dirty money uh, may or may not have had something to do with promise. Now, I know it sounds strange to talk about Iran-Contra now in, in a world where uh, the United States is adamantly opposed to Iran. So Congress said, no, you can't supply the Nicaraguan Contras with weapons. Uh, the moves to supply Contras with weapons proceeded on several fronts, uh, many of which at this time are still alleged, several of which went all the way to congressional hearings, which makes me think that there's uh, some pretty good sand to these accusations. So we've got this one thing, this, this super software, this uh, kind of ring of power back in the 80s that might be too strong for one man or one government. And then we have this, this strange interaction of crime, drugs, and intelligence agencies across the Atlantic and across continents. And then we have one guy who may have figured out that these things are related. And his name is Danny Casalero. And that is what our episode is about this week. We hope you tune in. Thanks so much for watching. You can find us on Facebook. We'd love it if you followed us there. We have our own website, Stuff They Don't Want You To Know. You can always talk to us on Twitter. You can send us an email directly. We are conspiracy at discovery.com. Yeah.